Hello, I am Joshua P. Warren, and this is Joshua P. Warren Daily. And you know what, Jedis? It is now time for you to relax and receive. And you might be saying, wait a second, that doesn't sound very proactive. What do you mean? Oh, but listen, it is part of a strategy, a strategy that works, and I am going to explain everything to you in this podcast what i mean by that and what you need to do what we need to do now as an army of jedis hey april is basically halfway over that's pretty good isn't it that's a pretty nice thing <laughs> given the things i've told you about april being such a weird month in the past but look before i get into that I hope that everybody had a, an enjoyable holiday weekend. I know that uh, it was terrible on Easter Sunday. Uh, late that night, there were many storms that just raged through the southeastern United States, flooding, uh, spinning off tornadoes. Uh, I mean, it, it, people died there was a lot of destruction and believe me i understand there are people who send me messages and say i i think the angels are blowing their trumpets and the seven seals are being opened uh i understand can you imagine being in the middle of all this you know this madness and then you have a big natural disaster like that on top of it and and we have our comet on the way i get it i understand so it's a sad thing it, fortunately all we can say is it could have been a hell of a lot worse so uh, hopefully you were not one of those people who had to endure that extra sort of uh i would say insult to injury but it, it, it may be more like injury to injury i will just tell you that i consider myself blessed and I hope that you can say the same about yourself I had a really wonderful holiday weekend for Easter and uh, you know here in, in Las Vegas of course we have compared to the rest of this country pretty good weather anyway but on Saturday the residents of the Las Vegas area got a special treat and that is because of course, we have Nellis Air Force Base here, which is connected to Area 51 and all that business. But it's also the home of the United States Air Force Thunderbirds, which is one of these, um, I guess, aerial acrobatic demonstration teams that flies around and puts on shows with these fighter planes, like the Blue Angels does for the Navy. And so the Thunderbirds... They decided they would put on a little show for us on Saturday, and uh, they they put in the news like, "Stay at your home, you know, don't that don't get out of your house." But you know, of course, I have a nice balcony here, and um, there were people who were walking out on you know onto the street and stuff. But at 2:30 p.m. on Saturday, they had a number of F-16 uh, fighter jets that were flying all around the Vegas area. And um, they were doing that, uh, they say, uh, officially in order to honor those who are working against this whole pandemic situation. So that was a cool thing. You know, Lauren and I were able to sit there and sip some drinks on the balcony and, and watch the Thunderbirds fly around. So that was nice. And then on Easter itself, on Easter Sunday, um, you know, it's it's, uh, it's it's very unusual, of course, for all of us to sort of be stuck at home. So it's just me and Lauren here in Las Vegas. So, uh, you know, we don't have any kids or anything like that. So it could have just been a typical day. I'm sure that if I had been in North Carolina, my mom would have prepared a glorious Easter basket full, full of uh, terribly unhealthy things <laughs> for us to gorge on like like we need that but um, we decided well you know what the hell Let's, we'll splurge a little bit more and so Lauren and I actually made with stuff we had right here in the house some really really good 
uh, cookie dough that you just you eat the dough you know what I'm talking about it's like this is cookie dough that you don't have to bake it has no eggs in it it was a really easy recipe we got from the Food Network and oh man the, if you if you like that you know cookie dough there there's a whole store here in Vegas a shop that just sells nothing it's like an ice cream shop but you go in there and all it is is cookie dough and of course everybody's had cookie dough ice cream I'm a sucker for cookie dough you might even say I'm a little bit of a cookie dough snob. And let me tell you, I posted the recipe for this very easy to make cookie dough on my uh, Twitter. I tweeted it at Joshua P. Warren, at Joshua P. Warren. And then I posted it on Facebook. And um, at least one lady contacted me and goes, yeah, but does it really taste like cookie? Yeah, I'm, t I'm not I'm not bullshitting you. All right. It has the texture. It's got the taste. We did substitute milk for yogurt, but look, see all the information you get on this podcast? I'm giving you a recipe for the love of God. Isn't that nice? What a sweet thing. You're getting recipes now. I, I'm not, well, that's not the full recipe, but I will tell you, we did, we did not have the plain yogurt, so we substituted the milk. Anyway, if you have some shit in your cabinets that you don't know what to do with, well, maybe you ought to go look at the cookie dough recipe that I tweeted out there and you might be very happy with it so look we have made merry of ourselves I I cracked open my homemade wine that's been sitting there percolating for over two weeks and you know what not worth a shit uh it's it's terrible and well actually you know it didn't taste that bad it just didn't taste very alcoholic it tasted more like apple juice or something and I realized the problem was had the temperature wrong I got the wrong temperature I'm not going to get into the specifics but I'm gonna make another batch and this time the temperature is gonna be right and I know I'll get it get it the next time gives me something cool to look forward to so anyway that's sort of what I've been up to again hope you've had uh, an interesting and pleasurable Easter holiday experience as we now start looking at the last half of this month. So let's get to the point that I really want to make when I say that it is now time to relax and receive. Because I've been giving you these tips and these steps that we should all be taking in order to evaporate this coronavirus fear and all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world all around you know circling all around this this phenomenon so let me explain to you what i mean being a jedi using the force manifesting things is not just about sending your intention out viciously and just hammering it constantly like a wild animal no it is a methodical thing that must be done strategically a part of that is projecting and then a part of that is relaxing in order to receive the corresponding resonance via sympathetic resonance that comes in a wave back and I've been doing this a lot lately but it's fitting I'm going to read to you a short passage from my book called Use the Force, A Jedi's Guide to the Law of Attraction, which you can read perhaps even for free on Amazon right now. Um, I don't, I, if you have Amazon Prime, I think you might be able to read it for free. You can listen to me read the whole audio book um, or you can purchase it, you know, as a paperback, whatever you want. But uh, here on page 74 is what I want to share with you regarding the stage we are at right now in our project. It says, relax, then seize. Have you ever struggled to, um, or excuse me, let me start again. Have you ever struggled trying to swipe a gnat from your drink? Whenever you poke your finger toward it, the gnat always seems to move away. But if you hold your finger still and wait for a moment, it will probably move closer to you, allowing you to gently swipe it to the side of the cup. Imagine yourself alone in a large swimming pool full of floating inflated beach balls. 
If you flail around chaotically, you are apt to continually push them away from you. But if you are still calm and relaxed, they will float right up to you. In fact, they may even stick to you. You should think of your state during the period of manifestation in a similar way. Instead of bolting after your vision, sit back, calm and relaxed, allowing the things you want to drift toward you. Then, when the timing is right, seize them. It is important to trust that your intention projected properly into the universe is working for you all the time in the background attracting your wishes. Using the law of attraction is not just about pushing your demands into the force, but also being patient enough to receive the fruits of your thoughts in due time. Determining the reasonable timeline within which your intention should materialize reminds us of Obi-Wan's words to Luke as the student trains with the Force on the Millennium Fandom. Obi-Wan says, quote, let go of your conscious self and act on instinct, end quote. You understand? In fact, uh, it's really strange, this whole thing about receiving. There are people who live their entire lives and have very fruitful, lucrative experiences in their lives by just every single day they wake up and they say today I'm going to focus on receiving I'm just going to be in the mindset of receiving now that's not the same thing as entitlement or begging or guilt tripping people and and trying to make people feel like that they owe you something no it's just you waking up and saying I feel like the universe is going to take care of me today and put something special in my path. And if you get into that frequency of receiving, there are people who every single day they go out and they just find treasures and they just get opportunities because all they do is just stay in that mindset of receiving. That's a whole different thing that I also write about in the book. Uh, it's what it's it works better for some people than others it's kind of hard to do that if you're a real type a high anxiety type of person um, but my point here is when we started our project together in order to change what's happening with the fear surrounding this situation and to try to bring people back to uh, a more reasonable state and protect our rights and, and all that sort of thing. What we did was we started at a high vibration. We started on the astral plane, the etheric plane, the psychic plane. We started by creating a, a high vibration, very powerful thought form that we just blasted out all over the world like gamma rays just and then we have gradually shifted that momentum down closer to the physical fabric of reality which of course includes things like contacting your politicians and all that and so what we have essentially accomplished here together is taking something systematically from a high vibration a mental vibration a spiritual vibration and we have now uh, condensed it into a physical force that has been broadcast out to the, the people who are making physical decisions and we have put just a shock wave a shock wave of energy and intention into that and now Nothing can come to us unless we relax because that is, there are only really two states that you can experience in the universe. One is to contract and the other is to relax, right? So we have we've broadcast this big powerful shockwave. So now it's time to do the opposite. Now you have to relax and just chill out 
don't say anything about this. Don't make any comments about it. Don't post anything on the internet about it. I mean, it's okay if you still want to have conversations with your, your, your friends, you know, like your personal associates and family and all that. But, but publicly, at this point, don't do anything. You are now stopping the energy that is being added into feeding this thing. We have sent out the intention for what we want to happen and what we, you know, that's how manifestation works. But now you have to just stop feeding the whole thing. And you just have to chill the fuck out. All right. Just chill the fuck out. Don't comment about it on Twitter or Facebook or any of that stuff. Relax and receive. This is the good part of manifestation when you do that. And it's uh, and oddly enough, you it seems like when something like this starts becoming really boring for everybody, it kind of goes away. Have you noticed that? There are these big things that happen in the mainstream media that just inflame everybody and pisses everybody off. But then, give it a little time, people get bored with it. And it goes away. Then they just try to say, oh, shit, what are we going to do? What's our next thing going to be to inflame everybody? We're reaching the boredom stage with this. And that's good. That's how we get it to go away. Relax. Receive. Chill out. Try to limit your exposure to this in the mainstream media. A lot of you are doing that already, and that's good. Do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. You know, I, um, I you know, I, I've been self-employed since I was a teenager. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm in charge of many different companies and projects. And so I'm in a position where more than the average person, I have to sort of stay on top of what is happening in the mainstream and underground worlds both so that I can sort of communicate to to you um who, who may not usually have the time <laughs> uh an, an opinion or a viewpoint on the the craziness of life that we're all simultaneously experiencing and often you know i will get over 1000 emails in a week from individuals or 1,000 messages of one kind or another for, through various formats from individuals. And as I've told you, there's no way that I can answer all of them. I do my best to read all of them. And it's almost a, just like a part-time job, just doing that, just doing just reading emails. Uh, so I, I, I hope that none of you ever get offended if, if I don't write you back. But my point is that I reach times where I'm like, you know, what? I'm not spending my whole life with my nose stuck into the internet. That's not the real world. So sometimes I just get away from my computer, from my cell phone. I just turn the shit off. I'm like, look, if somebody dies, I, well, I can't resurrect them. So, you know, it can wait a day or two. I don't need to know immediately if somebody dies. I mean, there are very few things that you need to know immediately. Maybe if like, you know, there's a tornado in your neighborhood or your house is on fire or, you know, like there, there are very few things you need to know immediately. So anyway, I've been chilling out a little bit more. I am, my TV projects are winding down, even though they're about to kick back up in May. So Lauren and I, um, you know, we'll sit down and say, hey, let's watch something that we maybe even wouldn't usually watch. And I always have this little list in the back of my mind of unusual things to watch. So let me ask you this. Have you ever watched this documentary that it's, it's black and white? And in 1951, um, it won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. It's called Contiki. Contiki. And 
it was it, it, this is about um, something that happened in 1947. It was turned into a book, and then the book uh, accompanied a documentary. And yes, there have been some like recent, more recent movies made. I understand. I haven't seen them that are dramatizations. But um, the the documentary from 1951. It's a little over an hour long. Called Contiki is something that I was able to watch for free on. I think it was Amazon Prime, and I really enjoyed it. And it brings up some stuff, some interesting little points that I want to, to share with you on this particular podcast. So here I am, I'm just chilling out. I'm like, hey, let's watch an old documentary. Because there aren't really a lot of old documentaries that are well done. You, usually the old documentaries seem to be more like propaganda or something. Because film was expensive. And documentary crews don't have a big budget. And so now you have documentaries out the wazoo, but back in the older days, you didn't have too many really, really well done documentaries. And and you can even see, uh, you know, there are plenty of things that are missing from Contiki that uh, one might imagine should be in there. But here's the story. So in 1947, there was this Norwegian scientist named Thor Heyerdahl who had this theory and his theory was that the Polynesian islands, you know what I'm talking about, out there in the Pacific Ocean, um, that they were not originally populated by people from Asia, which was the belief at that time. He thought that it was more likely that they had been populated by people from South America, around Peru and Ecuador, uh, ancient people who may have been able to build just balsa rafts which is all they supposedly could build back in those days and make it thousands of miles on these little shitty rafts across the Pacific Ocean all the way to the Polynesian Islands and he believed that for, in part because that he saw a lot of statues and sculptures and petroglyphs and stuff in the islands that looked very similar to things he had seen in South America but also that there was um, a strong current and some strong trade winds that he thought would have made it uh, very easy uh, to, to, to propel one of these, you know, little lightweight shitty balsa rafts all the way from South America across the Pacific Ocean to those islands. So in order to prove his theory, he went down there and took I think four guys with him and they worked with locals and they built a raft this is not a boat okay a raft to the specifications that the ancient people of South America would uh, would have made them and that everybody came out and you know cheered them on and kissed their asses goodbye because they went sailing off these like five Norwegian dudes on this raft across the Pacific Ocean. And, you know, they were on their own. Now, I don't want to spoil the story, but I will tell you that they did make it. Okay. They did make it. I guess I did spoil it, but okay. It's 1951. If you haven't, if you don't know this by now, you know, I'm sorry, that's your fault. So anyway, look, 1951, that's when the documentary came out. They made it there. But it, it actually is more dramatic than that. You have to watch the documentary. But they were on this, this raft for a hundred, I think a hundred and one days. Now, you know, three months, that's 90 days. So you're talking, you know, a hundred and one days on this raft. And the whole time they never saw one single ship. I think he said that at some point um, that he, they were like 2,300 miles away from any land. I mean, they're just out there on their own. By the way, I still don't understand exactly why they didn't at least have a regular boat sort of kind of follow along maybe a mile or two behind or whatever, uh, just in case. I, that's what I would have done if I was going to do that journey. I would have said, "Oh yeah, I'm definitely having a regular boat with an engine, 
and regular, you know, modern shit on it following me in case this thing sinks because it's probably going to sink and everybody pretty much thought this is going to sink. I don't know why they didn't do that. But anyway, as these guys are going through, and they don't have, I mean, the only modern stuff they had, they had a a, a radio on there so they could communicate um, with certain stations and usually with stations that were thousands of miles, like, you know, New Zealand or wherever. And, um, And they did a good job of keeping that stuff working. And they didn't have any firearms. They just had spears, harpoons, fishing lines. It was, it was really, really basic. So these guys are just, you know, running around in their shorts on this thing for, you know, three, three and a half months or whatever. And, um, so I was thinking, what, you know, what are they going to drink? I mean, surely they couldn't bring that much water with them on this little raft. And here's one of the the interesting things that I learned about from watching this documentary. One is that there were certain fish, big old fish that they could pull out of the water and you slice these fish open and they have some kind of a sack inside of them that essentially has fresh water you can drink. Like I said, it didn't taste too great, but you could potentially live if you can fish and you and you're lucky enough to catch the right fish there are certain fish you can catch and you can drink the fluid from the sack inside the fish and survive hopefully you will never need to use that knowledge but now you have it secondly i think he said that they were surprised to find that you can drink a solution that is like 60 percent fresh water with 40 percent salt water and still live So that means if you and I are trapped together on a raft that's drifting across the ocean and we only have enough water, fresh water, for one of us, well, apparently we could add some salt water and almost double that supply. So again, hopefully you'll never need that information. Now you have it. As they were drifting across the ocean, uh, one of the things they kept pointing out was we are out here all alone and there are all these fish that uh, have never probably seen anything man-made and they're not being scared away by engines and motors and all the noisy stuff that a regular modern boat does and so we are getting even more of an interaction and they had all kinds of big dramatic interactions with sharks and whales and uh, uh, whale sharks and flying fish and like every day they get up and they'd have flying fish that had landed on the raft you got to just see this documentary all right um so there's a lot of interesting stuff there as you sort of imagine what these guys uh went through during this this journey to prove this point but i bring this up to you not only because maybe you'll find it you know just mildly interesting but there are some other uh, things involved here that i think are really fascinating the fact that they made it that they went I, and again i i think it was 4300 miles or so it was uh, I, I can't remember i don't have all the stats but they made it thousands and thousands of miles across the pacific ocean using an ancient raft and they went through storms and all kinds of stuff the fact that they did that should clearly demonstrate that ancient people were capable of traveling all over this planet way before we had good recorded records. I mean, look at what you know the, the types of ships the Vikings had for the love of God. Okay, and, and I mean, way better than a raft. And when you when you look at North America, you have all these weird structures and carvings that seem to indicate that you know these Europeans for sure were coming over here long before uh, Columbus and the Spaniards. But even going like even more ancient than that, I am a firm believer that the Mayans were able to travel north up through a good portion of North America, through Florida, up through Georgia, through North Carolina, I believe that probably uh, the markings at, uh, I believe it's Track Rock in Georgia 
and Judah Color Rock and North Carolina are probably of Mayan origin. And uh, I think the Mayans probably uh, went to Puerto Rico. Uh, you, you know, you, you have also these place names like Miami, Florida, and Mayaca, Florida, and Mayoez, Puerto Rico. And you look up like, well, why were they named that? Nobody knows. And yes, obviously the Maya called themselves something different than Mayan, but that doesn't matter because the people who named those places obviously referred to them as the Mayans, which is the same reason we refer to them as the Mayans. And so why do you have this Maya connotation to all these places? You have all these stories about giants. A lot of the Mayans were very tall people. There's been some very compelling evidence in Georgia, for example, that the, um, I believe they said that the, um, the blue dye that they used in the Mayan culture had some Georgia clay in it. So look, we, we probably can't even come close to understanding uh, how human exploration really evolved in, in real time. And just think back in those days, you know, if you were a criminal, for example, or you thought you were gonna be prosecuted as a criminal, they were going to do some really horrible shit to your ass. Uh, you were going to be severely, severely tortured. And how many people who had access to a, a raft or a boat or whatever said, okay, s uh, screw that. I'm out of here. I'm going to take my chances on this boat. And if I die in the ocean, oh, well, it'll probably be a better death than the shit these people are going to do to me. And so that's why you also had a lot of scallywags. A lot of real like piece of shit assholes who would get out there and go into these other places and abuse the uh, natives they would find you know so uh, human exploration has been a been a messy thing but I think that it, it, it was it's far far more extensive than what we think as we look back uh, through our textbooks here in the year 2020 and it's it's really time for us to start opening our minds to <laughs> to what most likely people were capable of doing in those days. So that's one thing that I wanted to bring up, which of course is uh, an interesting part of thinking uh, uh, about Contiki. But here's the other thing. So my understanding is in the book Contiki, which I have not read, Thor Heyerdahl talks about when he was in South America in 1947, actually went just, you know, down there in the 40s, because it was 47 when they left, but he'd been going down there for a while and, you know, doing research and getting prepared for all this. So in the 1940s, in uh, South America, over there again on the West Coast, around Peru and uh, that area, uh, he was trying to get locals to help him get the knowledge of how the ancients would have built these balsa rafts and there were certain areas that people would not go into the locals would say ah no 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 no, we are not going over into that jungle we're not going over into those woods because those people will cut your head off and shrink it and sell it they were making shrunken heads even in the 1940s. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even outlawed until the 1960s. There were people in that part of South America who were uh, killing people and digging up dead bodies and you know, cutting their heads off to make shrunken heads to sell. And I guess they officially could do that all the way up until the 1960s. And one thing that also is very interesting about that is just so happens that Lauren and I were recently watching the Smithsonian Channel. And there was a program that had a whole episode about the history of shrunken heads. And sure enough, they talked about this one particular tribe uh, there in, in the Amazon region. And there were actually a number that did it, but there was one in particular. I can't remember. I think it was called like the Shura or something like that. I can't remember. You can look it up. But um, 
it said that what they would you know what they did for hundreds of years is is um if they if one tribe went to war with another tribe then a warrior would you know kill another warrior and then he cut his head off and believed that his the other warrior's head was in that spirit uh excuse me his spirit was in that head and then he would shrink that head down and wear it for a while believing that by doing that he would slowly absorb the uh, spirit of the other warrior into his body and then after a while well they just got sort of i guess they figured well i guess i get the spirits out there and then they'd throw them away or give them to kids to play with and um this went on until like the victorian period in the 1800s when everybody especially in, in england was all into really ghoulish grim stuff and uh there were a lot of english people running around south america and they started buying these little shrunken heads and bringing them back you know trading them for firearms and whatnot and created this uh, enormous marketplace for them and so a shrunken head became worth a lot of money and so these natives in the amazon region uh after they kind of ran out of their regular supply of shrunken heads that's when they went out and started murdering people or or just cutting the heads off of um of dead people and shrinking them down or then you have this whole other layer of like English people who said, well, shit, I'm cashing in on this too. And so they started digging up graves, you know, the body snatcher type thing. And they started making English shrunken heads. Um, so there, it was, it was, it was kind of like a cluster fuck shrunken head business was going on down there for, I don't know, at least 50, hundred years, maybe. And of course, when they make, when they shrink a head down, what they do first off is they um they peel the skin off of the skull that's the first thing so the skull is is removed and uh the brain is removed and so then they uh, boil that flesh of the head with some herbs and spices you know kind of like kentucky fried chicken and then uh they take it out and they put some really really hot stones and sand inside of it and uh it just shrinks right up and they sew up the mouth and the and the eyes and everything to keep all that hot stuff in there and it just shrinks it right up and then when it's when it's finally done they take some real hot stones and they they kind of polish the exterior of it which is why they all look really coal black and what's funny is that I've seen a lot of shrunken heads in my life at museums and places like Ripley's and stuff, but they all looked so similar that I was always kind of suspicious. Like, I was like, how many shrunken heads are there really? Are there just like a handful? And then most of these are mass produced fakes. Turns out there was actually a shitload uh, of shrunken heads and because that they came the real ones came from the same region and all these people were more or less related in some way and the process they used was the same process which which also shrinks up the nose and kind of makes the nose look more like a pig snout and all that honestly a lot of these shrunken heads that are real uh, they do kind of look the same um but you know the, on this smithsonian uh program they had this forensic expert and he he was like we can tell this this is a real south american person here and this one is a european person who got his head shrunk down and so what they were doing is uh, taking computers and um trying to recreate from a shrunken head what that person looked like in life um, who knows how accurate that is but not my point is even though a lot of these shrunken heads kind of look the same they really apparently are um, in many cases authentic and, and but they're just from the same kind of area and they're you know they kind of look the same but there's a lot of fake stuff out there also you see 
And so I became really curious as to, hmm, well, okay, what, is, what does it take to get a real shrunken head? Because, you know, I'm a museum type guy. I have a, the creepy Vegas ghost and UFO show. And I was wondering, what does it take to get a real, like, how much is a real shrunken head? And do I even want to own such a thing? I mean, I do already have some human body parts, so... I I can't tell you more about that. You have to come to the Creepy Vegas show if you want to see what I'm talking about. But um, I don't know. To have a little, like a real person's little shrunken head, somebody who was probably murdered or whatever, I don't know. I don't know if it's the kind of thing I'd want to own. But I got curious as to the marketplace. And what I found is that um, if you want to go out nowadays and buy a real, authentic, South American shrunken head, and I say South American because you know there are exceptions. As a matter of fact, this is this is really twisted. But um, during the Holocaust, the Germans, the Nazis, they shrunk the head of a Jewish man. And they put that thing on display. I think it was called the shrunken head of, yeah, Buchenwald, B-U-C-H-E-N-W-A-L-D. The shrunken head of Buchenwald. They shrunk down the head. They used that same technique, shrunk the head of uh, a Jewish man and put it sort of like in an area in this concentration camp where all the other Jews could see it just to scare them to death. And be like, oh boy, this is how much these people think of us, right? And that was actually a piece of evidence that was used during the Nuremberg trials. So if you've never seen this uh, Jewish head shrunken by the Nazis, go just do a search on uh, shrunken head of Buchenwald, B-U-C-H-E-N-W-A-L-D, and you'll see some pictures of this. So anyway... If you wanted to go out and for whatever reason buy an authentic shrunken head, then my understanding is, well, for one thing, you know, most of them are in museums and they're, they're hard to get, but there are brokers out there who specialize in this. And apparently the minimum amount you have to pay, now I want you to take a guess, all right? How much do you think the minimum amount is to get a real shrunken head? I'll give you a second. What do you think? Throw a number out there. The minimum amount is $8,000. And they, so they say usually they range between eight and $20,000 based on the quality. And apparently some have gone at auction for over $40,000. So you'd really have to want one of those things for some reason, wouldn't you? Uh, to pay that kind of money for just a little thing that sits there. I mean, you know, it's a dead person's head, you know? I mean, again, I, there's a marketplace for everything. If you own a museum and you're selling tickets, oh, here you go. Here, we have a we have a head. Check that thing out. Um, but I started looking at this whole, like, shrunken head marketplace, and I thought to myself, you know what? I don't want a shrunken head. I really don't. Maybe I'll change my mind someday. But, but, you're thinking, oh God, what's coming next, Josh? Where are you going with this? The people in the Amazon who made the original shrunken heads are still making shrunken heads for tourists but they're making them out of goat leather. Now, they actually could easily just make a little shrunken goat head, and, and I would not buy that, okay? Uh, and I know I probably shouldn't be buying anything leather. Don't send me hate mail. I, I do have a leather jacket, and, uh, and I do eat a lot of chicken. So, but please don't send me any hate mail. But there's this place out there that the, the, you know, the original shrunken head people 
they're they're still making replica shrunken heads but they're using goat leather and so I said you know what I'm gonna buy one I'm gonna buy one I just I don't know I gotta have some weird shit like this so I bought it and <laughs> Lauren knew that I had been on this kind of shrunken head kick for a little while so I thought hey I'm gonna have Lauren open this thing and uh she is not going to know what it is and then when she opens it as soon as she sees it looks kind of like a shrunken head she's going to flip out because she's going to say oh jesus this is a shrunken head and th so i uh so i made it all dramatic i said lauren i got something new today and i want you to open it and she goes what 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 is this and i go i'm not going to tell you but i'm going to videotape you while you open it <laughs> It, by the way, if you've never done that to a loved one, I highly recommend you try that out. Just It doesn't matter what it is. Prepare, prepare for some disappointment, though, because some women are going to expect a big old diamond ring or something in there. But Lauren knows me way better than that. She knows it's going to be something fucked up in this box, probably. So anyway, I give her the box. I'm like, okay, I'm videotaping you now. Open the box. And so she opens the box. And she says, yeah, it's a shrunken head. And she goes, I know it's not real because you told me how much they cost. <laughs> See, that's where I screwed up. I told her beforehand how much they cost. But if she didn't know how much they cost, she'd have probably believed it was real. So anyway, we take this shrunken head out. And, it, you know, it's a pretty good looking replica. Maybe I'll, I'll take a picture of it and post it for you, as a matter of fact. Um... But Lauren looks, I, I told her, yeah, I said, yeah, okay, well, this, this is made from goat leather. And she goes, that is a goat's nut sack. I said, well, how can you be so sure of that? She goes, look at it. It's a goat's ball. They took a goat's scrotum and turned it into this thing for, you know, you to have. And I, I said, well, look, maybe so. Maybe that's what, I mean, is there a whole goat scrotum business out there and if you know the answer to that feel free to email me all you have to do is go to joshua p and let is there a goat scrotum business like every time you buy a fake shrunken head has a goat lost you know it's scrotum uh maybe i don't know but it, you know now she's telling me this is a goat scrotum i'm like Every time I look at it, I think, yeah, I, maybe this probably is a, a goat scrotum. Oh, well. Uh, you know, I, look, I, I love animals, but um, I realize, you know, I doubt a goat is going to, like, discover the cure for cancer someday. So, I mean, if, if a goat dies and they eat it and they have a scrotum left over and they're like, well, do we throw this in the garbage or make a, a little trinket out of it we can sell to joshua p warren you know fine i understand why they would do that yeah i'll post a picture of it just go to uh, go to at joshua p warren I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it at joshua p warren at joshua p warren i'm not gonna say it's a goat scrotum though because i don't know you can look at it and you can tell me but so now i have this little shrunken head sitting uh you know displayed in my house I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is. And I don't know why that I have that. I mean, I could have taken that money that I spent on this goat scrotum and fed a starving child, I guess. But that's not what happened. So anyway, uh, I've got this odd piece. and Maybe I'll incorporate it someday into one of my museums or... Um, or shows or whatever so getting back to Contiki <laughs> the kind of extra getaway time that I had on my hands over Easter weekend to relax turned into me watching Contiki which taught me a lot of things the Contiki documentary including how to survive better without water when you're out at sea and 
how to better gauge you know the wayfarers and the travelers that have passed all all over the world in ancient times and and a little something about shrunken heads in, in that business as well. You see, one thing leads to another, and now here I am sharing it with you. Speaking of balls and scrotums and stuff like that, have you ever seen the movie Watchmen? There is, and I'm not going to explain this if you don't know what I'm talking about, but there is a character who has a big blue dick. Uh, he always runs around naked. His name is Dr. Manhattan. He has a big blue dick. And uh, he has sort of like infinite powers. And so he decides, screw Earth. I'm going to go live on Mars all by myself. And that's what he does. So he just sort of teleports himself to Mars. Again, he has infinite power, so he doesn't have to worry about oxygen or radiation or heat or any of that crap. And he just sits there in total peace as the only being on Mars. And I posted the other day, what a world we have. I'm feeling I might do a Dr. Manhattan, Mr. Blue Dick from Watchmen and just go hang out on Mars for a while. Sounds nice, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, how many of you are, are feeling that way? We're in a strange, strange situation. But like I say, let's have some fun. Let's laugh. Let's relax. Let's say, yeah, it is time to chill out and do your own thing and just kind of do some stuff that you enjoy and make the most of this. I told you that this has been very hectic for me, especially because I've, I'm still working on some TV stuff, which some of that is again winding down for this month. But I posted also on my uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and I don't do that much on Instagram really, but if you know, I am on Instagram. So if you are, look me up. It's probably Shadowbox ENT. That's probably what it is. Or you, maybe you can just put in Joshua P. Warren. I don't know. Um, but when you go to um, to my, any of that social media stuff, I posted a picture and I said, you'll be seeing these babies on national TV soon. Because one of the shows that I've been working on is a very popular show. I say national, but I could say international. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you know, you, you can probably kind of like read between the lines and figure out what I've been doing here in Las Vegas, working on a TV show. Who could that be? What could that be? You figure that out. Um, so I posted a picture of a Tesla coil, my big granddaddy Tesla coil, and a Van de Graaff machine. And I've been surprised by how many people have written to me and said, well, what are these and what do they do? And without giving you a big old lesson, I just want to sort of tell everybody right now that, um, okay, we'll start with a Van de Graaff machine. I have written about this in many books like How to Hunt Ghosts and talked about them for years. A Van de Graaff machine is one of those things they use in a lot of school science demonstrations with the big silver ball on top and you put your hands on it and it makes your hair stand on end. And um, when, you, when you turn on a Van de Graaff machine, it builds up a big charge, a big positive charge in the area. It's a DC standing electrostatic charge. If you haven't taken my online paranormal investigator course, you might not know what I'm talking about, but I break this down to make it very easy for you if you take my course, which is at the curiosity shop of joshuapwarren.com. So anyway, when you turn this thing on, it charges the room up. And what that means is if you have some type of, let's say an entity there that is barely tangible, that wants to appear, but is not solid enough, then the idea is that these charges, especially in a darkened room, 
will build up around that form and allow it to become visible. It's kind of like wrapping bandages around the invisible man so that you can see him. But instead of bandages, we're wrapping him with electrostatic charge so he starts to glow blue. That's the theory behind using a Van de Graaff in order to make things more apparent to the naked eye that would otherwise be invisible. The Tesla coil is different. The Tesla coil is AC, which means it's constantly switching between positive and negative, so it doesn't build up an electrostatic charge, but it's what we call a resonant transformer. And so basically when you turn that on, it's more or less sending shock waves out there all the time. You know how I've talked about shock waves and the law of attraction and manifestation? Well, imagine something that's sending out uh, thousands or millions or billions of shock waves every second in a confined space. That's what a Tesla coil is doing. The, little, the lightning bolts that it shoots is just a byproduct. What it's really doing is shooting out these ripples. Now, the reason that's interesting is because you take something like a sandcastle that's held in place by all these individual particles. But if you shake it, what happens? They all break up and uh, they become malleable. They become flexible. So our environment is usually the product of some molecules that are relatively settled and fixed in place. You turn on that Tesla coil, it starts shaking up the environment. And now what that means is if we have some force that's trying to get through, it might not be able to so easily break the resistance of a normal environment, but you start shaking up the environment like those little sand grains and they become flexible and malleable well now this thing can break through more easily okay it's broken through but how do you see it well, now you turn your van de graaff generator on so hopefully you create a body of light around it from the electrical charge so using a tesla coil and a van de graaff generator together in tandem is a very effective way of creating um and visualizing uh, paranormal phenomena. That's, that's the gist of it. So for all of you who have posted on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, like what do these things do? You can see why I, I, I'd rather answer you this way through my podcast than <laughs> try to explain that in a post. Like I can say it enhances paranormal phenomena, but that doesn't tell you a lot really. So there you go. There's your explanation. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap this thing up here in a minute. Before I do that, though, I just want to point um, a couple things out. Number one, on my last podcast, I had told you that Dr. Liz and Dr. Mulder have a new podcast that you might enjoy checking out. And if and I have a link also on my uh, Twitter page there, at Joshua P. Warren. And I didn't want to tell you too much about Dr. Liz because I wanted her to send me her official bio. Well, I have it, and here it is. Uh, Dr. Liz Leclerc loves all things metaphysical. She is an ICF certified and Martha Beck trained life coach, a spiritual counselor, and a creative consultant for your personal and professional goals. She has trained in various energy healing arts, including the Four Wind Society Energy Medicine, Reiki, acupressure, and sound therapy, emotional freedom technique, and the emotion code and body code. She is a reverend with the Unitarian Universalist Association. She enjoys studying various streams of thought on the planet, and when she is not being a nerd, you may find her on her motorcycle or bumming around in her yurt. I don't know if you have a yurt, maybe that makes you a nerd too. I don't know. I'm just saying, you know what a yurt is? Yurt is, um, let's see, how, how do I describe this? I'm looking up the best way. It's a portable 
circular shelter that is used in nomadic homes, especially by people in Mongolia. Yeah, that's enough on that. And then, so, Doctor, I told Dr. Mulder, I said, Dr. Mulder, everybody knows who you are, but since, you know, let's have your, your, your official bio. Here it is. Because of his interest in the altering of reality through consciousness, Dr. Mulder has built and experimented with radionics for over 15 years. As of now, he has constructed and shipped many thousands of these custom-made instruments all over the world. Because of his collaboration with Joshua P. Warren, this has resulted in his being the most prolific manufacturer of these strange and mystical machines in the history of this technology. Among many applications, such as weather control, his machines have also been used by members of the American military to save lives in battle, and to influence the enemies of the U.S. along with altering the political landscape of foreign countries. So yeah, you might want to check out the Doctors Liz and Mulder podcast, which I linked to recently. Uh, I put it on Facebook and I also tweeted it at Joshua P. Warren. Check them out. Give them a listen. Very warm, respectful, uh, intellectual conversations. And, you know, I, I thank you both, uh, Dr. Liz and Dr. Mulder, for sending me that, me that info and, um, and doing what you're doing because, you know, they are, they're focused on, um, well, they're, you know, they're focused on very specific things. And, and, you know, it's interesting when it comes to radionics and psychotronics and psionics. I mean, uh, right now people are really, really using that and, and fi- just being helped enormously, just immensely. And, and, and you know, there are people out there who sometimes say, well, you don't need that stuff. You can just do this on your own. Well, look, I can make it from here to Maine by walking. Yeah, you can do it. Uh, I mean, it'd be better if I had a bicycle. It'd be even better if I had a car. It'd be even better if I had a plane. That's the value of tools. Yeah, yeah. I can heat up my hamburger by going out and building a bonfire, or I can pop it in the microwave. I like tools. I like doing things the easy way if I can, and that's what wishing machines and psychotronics and psionics help you to accomplish. So if you go to wishingmachineproject.com, wishingmachineproject.com. There's a little link there on the right side that says FAQ, it's red. Click here for the frequently asked questions and you should click that link and it will cover everything you want to know about can I make money with this? Can I gamble with this? How long will it take for things to happen for me? Um, Should I use the electric one or the non-electric one? And if I have the electric one, how do I use the electric part? Can more than one person use the machine? You know, can, 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 my, can I and my wife or I and my husband both use it? Um, all these questions are answered. There's so much free educational content there at wishingmachineproject.com. You really just need to go and check it all out. And I will leave you with this. If you go to joshuapwarren.com, you will also find a lot of really interesting stuff and I hope that you will share these links and this podcast with everybody. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because at joshuapwarren.com, I have a curiosity shop that has things you won't find anywhere else in the world. There was a woman recently who went to the curiosity shop and pretty much just bought one of everything. <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, how exciting would that be? How exciting would that be? Um, because as an adult, you know, usually you buy things you need, or maybe you're buying a toy for a kid and you see how excited the kid is, but it's kind of hard 
to buy things that really make you excited as as an adult and imagine if you went to joshua p warren.com went to the curiosity shop and said you know what i'm going to buy one of everything and you get one or two boxes that come to your house i'd love to see an unboxing video of all this just amazing metaphysical life-changing inspiring st- i mean it, it, it would be really too much it, it really I mean, you would be like where do i begin um, but just, you know, even if you, you don't, you don't want to buy anything, just go look at the stuff, watch the videos, learn about it. You know, Joshua P Warren.com. Click the link to the curiosity shop while you're there. Click the link to this podcast. And again, this podcast, if you've, if you enjoyed this, please tell everybody else about it, share it with them, forward it to them, your friends, your family, your loved ones, let them know this exists because if you click the link to this podcast called joshua p warren daily you'll find that it's you know it's always short there are no commercials it's uncensored so yeah maybe the the language gets a little rough for some people at times but oh well that's how it is it's r-rated language it's completely independent completely i don't take sponsors or advertisers So think about all that, all right? It's free, it's short, it's commercial free, it's independent, it's uncensored. When you click the link to this podcast, you can subscribe through various means. Take your pick, whatever you like, or just go subscribe to me on Twitter, at Joshua P. Warren, at Joshua P. Warren, and I will usually tweet when a new one is available. So I have a very interesting week ahead of me. I'll be telling you more about that soon. But uh, like I say, relax, chill out, receive, receive, okay? Oh, yeah. Also, while you're there at joshuapwarren.com, sign up for my free e-newsletter. It takes you two seconds, and that way I can blast really relevant information to you as quickly as possible. So that is it for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your interest and support. Thank you for staying curious. And I will talk to you again soon.